The two Jills, a psychologist and psychic intuitive, reveal mind-blowing insights that turn psychology, self-help, and conscious teachings on their heads. Why? Because they work. Real help, sincere growth is here. Welcome to Psyched. Hi, Jill. Hey, Jill. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great today. Good. I have my glasses on. I just, just want everybody to say my eyes glasses. are messed up. So I got my glasses on today if you're watching this on video. So it's a new look for me. I like your glasses. Okay, so Jill, I'm, I would like to talk today about parenting and when there is um, a parent-child relationship that um, there's just a weird kind of friction and conflict there. Um, I, I know something about this from client work and just other family relationships I've had. Um, there can be one parent that we're, we're really close to, and there might be another parent that we just feel like, gosh, I don't even feel like we're the same gene pool. What the heck? Um, which doesn't have to mean friction, but I'd like to go deeper um, in kind of a mini episode in a way about, okay, this is what it looks like. And these are some of the strategies so that we can both um, support individuals, whether they're that child or whether they're that parent. Does that sound okay? I think it does sound okay. So just to clarify for me, we're, we're talking about parents, not our parents, right? We're talking about parenting no, we, no, children. I, I think the strategies are actually for either because part of it is going to be insightful, even if you're um, a young adult or a, a full grown <laughs> adult child of an adult, and you never understood why you weren't close or why you've always been bothered by one of your parents. So I feel like the strategies can actually be incredibly useful and insightful both directions. Awesome. Okay. I love it. Let's go. Okay. Good. Okay. So one thing that I've realized, and this is a hypothesis, um, it gets very kind of out there esoteric idea, but one one idea that came to me is that when we are incarnate and we actually pick, some of us pick one parent and we're kind of okay with whomever that one parent picks to partner up with, to be the other parent in our incarnation. Um, a lot of people, when, when I mention that or when they hear that, they go, oh my God, that makes so much sense. And they know immediately which parent they picked and which parent was sort of like the ride along. Um, so that's a very interesting hypothesis that may actually explain some of the lack of closeness we feel with one parent and one or one child and one of the so one of the incredible closeness we can feel with the other. Um, so that's kind of part one. Jill, have you heard me talk about that before? I think we talked about we just touched on it in the sibling myth. Oh, that's so right. people yeah. can refer back to that episode for a longer take on that because um, I do think that's super interesting. And I have some thoughts on that too, but let's go to your second. Um, okay. So the other kind of relaxation that can happen is that it's okay if you naturally get along naturally and more smoothly with one child or one of your parents, it's give yourself permission that that's okay. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong with the other one. And it may actually reduce some of the tension in the relationship where you don't feel as naturally close, where it doesn't feel as naturally harmonious. Because the brain gets really stuck on, well, I love, you know, this, it's easier to love this one. We don't have to work at a harmonious relationship. So the brain says, what's wrong with this one? What if there's nothing wrong with that one? It's just that the other one is so freaking great. Yeah. Look, I mean, that is a, when we talk about the brain, right, that is one of those things that the brain doesn't let you go there. It really doesn't, we have to open up that space. That's what you're saying, to give a lot more grace in that space, to allow ourselves to have different relationships with each children without having a one size fits all rubric that we're trying to straddle with each, with each child. 
And I think that the brain will necessarily bring in things like guilt and something's wrong and and just shame even to keep us in our lane. And that's why I like to look for those things, really, whether there's an ideal version, I want to know what's my ideal version, because that's what people don't measure up to. So again, that's three different brain strategies that are automatic that you are trying to look for so that you can say, wait, I see the automatic aspect, but now I'm going to actually put that aside and bring myself back online and think about this with a different perspective, which is what you're sharing. It's so cool when we can do that. Mm -hmm. And, and it does take guts and grace, right. To, to question what we're told is, is the, is what is it's the it's what's given right this is a given you should love all your kids the same or treat them all the same that there is a a utopia an optimal situation there it's not true it's not true and there will i feel like it's very healthy and self-loving to appreciate that there are some people that are just easier to love there is just there's just, and it's not about them. It's just about some of the compatibility, the energy. It's, it's about so many different things. I would never ask pickles to go with ice cream. I just wouldn't, but yet that's what it feels like energetically some in some relationships, especially with children and especially with, with the child's parents, either way that we can be doing. And it's just sort of like, let's just, let's just let this be. And that we could, then we can redefine love because it isn't for lack of love. It's just that sometimes, you know, pickles are going to irritate the flavor profile of, of ice cream. And it's just like, let's just let that be because the brain can then stop. And I've seen it work so well. The brain then stops getting as irritated because it stopped trying to force fit something or declare that there's a problem either with them or with you. It's just like, oh, these just don't go as well together as the other ones. Let's just let that be that and this be this and then let the love that is there be exactly what it is. Yeah, that it's so perfect because people don't see irritation in that way. Irritation is the belief or desire that something should be different than it is. So what we do to try and get rid of irritation is we try to change the situation, person, place, or thing. That never works because that's not what irritation is. And people find when they change one thing, something, po something else pops out. You have something new to be irritated with because that program is still running. So what you're trying to say is notice I mean, not what you're trying to say, but what I but what I hear or the way I operate is notice the program, not the content of the program. It's not what irritates you. It's that you're irritated. And when you work and, and it's so it's like moving it back a layer because that you can always work with. You can always work with the with the program. You can't always work with the way the program manifests because that already is interactional and we don't have any control over that. Yeah. Irritable relationships cause friction for everybody. And it only takes one person in these dynamics to completely change the entire dynamic for everybody. Yeah. So this isn't, it's exciting. You don't need another person to agree with you. You don't need to. And I don't actually don't recommend whether you're the, I don't recommend a parent go to a child and go, I just listened to this podcast. And guess what? You probably picked the other parent, or I probably didn't say yes to you. I said yes to your sibling. So no wonder we don't get along very well. I don't think they're going to wrap you in a bear hug. I think they're going to go, what the hell did you, what are you talking about? because it's not a compliment, right? So I feel like this is, I have seen this type of information be more impactful on how you resort 
and reassess yourself relative to that person. They don't need, they don't need to know, and they probably may not have, they may not have the breakthroughs you might be having with this whole idea. So this is an internal thing. This isn't a, hey, I want to get together and have this really deep conversation about something that most people's brains and consciousness will just fly right over or right by them anyway. This is about how you perceive your relationship with that person. What and, is- and, and it's a very slippery slope here because you're not saying now that you have this theory that you can abdicate your responsibility and, and use it as an excuse to be like, oh, no wonder I don't love you. What you're saying is, and I hope that everybody hears, I'm just going to reiterate your point, you have to work with it. This is not an excuse to continue not liking that person or being frustrated and just saying, well, of course I'm frustrated. You, you, you know, we didn't pick each other. Right. Just to reiterate. Right. So now if you yeah, can I say, wouldn't even have thought to mention that. So I'm glad that you did. And of course, hopefully we're not talking about lack of love. There's just this confusion about God. I'm, I'm this way with this person, I think. And we just compliment each other. And with this other person, it feels like we're always, we're always bumping into it. What is going on there? This can be an amazing um, just insight into, oh my God. And then, and then there's less tension because there's less, your brain has an answer that it may feel better, explains everything, remove some of the tension. And once that tension is removed, that relationship can actually, the one that feels a little bit more prickly or a lot more friction-based can actually completely reorient because there's not to, to, there's not at least your force, you know, banging your head against it, thinking something is going wrong and I still haven't figured it out. So it can let more, and this is a, I'll try and describe this as best as I can. The brain can get in the way of our transmitting and receiving love, which is fascinating because there are so many people, especially those in esoteric types of ideology that will say, oh no, the love is always flowing. No, the brain is capable of actually blocking a sensation of warmth, compassion, um, grace, understanding, um, loving, love-based, I want to say criticism, but a uh, love-based, um, yeah, I guess let's just leave it at criticism because the word kind of fits there. Um, love-based judgments that are not like, I don't like you, but hey, I wonder if this would be more helpful, that sort of thing. So recognizing that when you can reorient, almost like reconfiguring the Jenga puzzle of your brain, you can let more of the love that I know we all can have almost for anything and anyone. Um, you can let more of that natural love that you have out without it running into these blocks that the brain can put up. I totally agree. I do find irritability to be an incompatible energy or frequency with love. And it's not that the love isn't there, but to your point, it is, it is, I'm going to say it is blocked, right? So to see it, it's a cop out in a way to say, I love you, but I don't like you very much. To me, that's not, that's us not doing the work. It's allowing two incompatible things. And the brain is very good at that. The brain can hold two conflicting beliefs. It is, and we call that hypocrisy, obviously, but it is magical at Mm. that and super deceptive. It doesn't let you see how your own brain conflicts with itself. You think there is a consistency there. The other thing that I want to get back to, because I I see a lot of times in my work that a lot of the friction that comes with one, one child or one family dyad is because that that child or parent is most like you. And so in that in that regard, there's this element where we're trying to fix that person. We're like, we're a foregone conclusion, but that person has the same, my child has the same instincts or, you know, tendencies that I have. And I'm trying to correct 
my issues through that child. So that's also another thing is to notice how how close, how similar that person is, and then come in with the grace that you talk about. Give yourself more space to have those quirks, whatever they are. And when you give yourself that space, it naturally, just energetically, you give that to someone else. It, it That's how energy works. You only have to shift it up in one space to shift the whole dynamic, if you will. So good. I'm. Thank you for bringing that up. And I like to, um, I want to add on to that, that just because something irritates you doesn't, and I know I, you, I, I know you and I have talked about this before and we're on the same page on this, but some people may not have heard those other conversations. I just want to offer for people that sometimes there is some people that believe that if something irritates you in another person, it automatically means it's something that irritates you in yourself. And that's not what Jill and I are saying. We're saying that, yes, it might be that what irritates you is something in yourself but it can also be something that irritates you and another person has nothing to do with you. It's just a personal preference. And, oh, I really, I've, I always hated people that are stuck up or, you know, something. So it doesn't right. have to be that, but thank you for Jill for adding that. Yeah. The other, yes. The other kind of step or stage to this is watching what your brain is doing and having responses as you recognize the patterns of your brain, Right. So when the brain says, oh my God, I hate it when he does this, or I hate it when she does that, that you have a ready response, ready to go to, it's almost like disarming the irritation. So some that I've seen work really well with my clients is, so what? So what? So they're showboating after they made that, that basket and basketball in whatever grade. So what? And it kind of makes the brain go, right? So another one could be, and what are you going to do about it? I mean, like, are you going to run out there and, you know, grab them by the shoulders and prevent them from being a showboat? Are you going to try to passive aggressively punish them after the game? I mean, where are you going with this? And is that really who you want to be? Right? I know these seem maybe a little extreme, but I, I find that for very strong brains that almost can't resist irritation, it does take kind of an equal force to disarm the irritation or the anger or whatever that is. A third one that really works really well is Oh, but they are them and I am me. I don't get, I don't have the right of being that person. They have the right of being that person. And I have the right of being me. And there's something for, for a lot of people. And I know for myself, it makes the brain go, oh yeah, that's right. Like, I can't think for both of us. Like, what am I doing? Because the irritation in many people energetically is pretending that you have more control than you do about another person or a situation. So when you start to kind of call bullshit on that energy, it stops going there because there is nowhere, in my view, productive to go with that. And that's a practice. So it is people that I see a lot. There's a, well, I tried it and it didn't work. In order to disarm your brain and to really get out of this habit, Habit takes longer than just one shot. And then the brain also tries to say, I did that. How does it feel? You don't want to disarm the brain and then kick it in right away by asking, did it work? Did it work? Did it work? That's like the one-two punch. You're trying to disarm the brain and notice when you then ask the brain to assess your disarmament. <laughs> so that's the that's the thing that people get stuck in a lot is they're asking the brain to assess the interventions we're making on the brain. You can see the conflict of interest there. And I do what you do. I say, do I really care? Do I really care? That that just stops me in or my brain in its tracks. And another thing that I say a lot is I am never upset for the reasons that I think. My brain gives me a whole host of rationalizations, justifications, excuses, self-righteousness of why the, the way that person breathes bothers me. And you will find those. If you ask the brain to justify your feelings, you will find all the justification for your position. 
But again, we're not asking the brain for that. You do not want to know what the brain has to say about why you are yet again irritated. And so I just ask, do I really care? And this is about how you're saying, notice your lane. We are jumping into other people's lanes all the time. Just stay in your lane. Life is so much easier there. It really is. Perfect. The main goal for all of this, this is like the ultimate kind of goal. And this could be, it could prompt curiosity in the brain, which I think is always a good sign because the brain starts to kind of let go of its rigidity when it's curious and wondering about something, which is better. But it just isn't the same as a why question and what's happening. It's kind of a, hmm, I wonder what will happen. I wonder is a great state of the brain to be in when you're trying to prompt um, change and growth and new outcomes and new behaviors. So the main goal is that you're, you're letting yourself get to the layers of you that have no problem, absolutely loving that other person exactly as they are. And I just feel that because the brain is like, no, 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 no. Hang on. You stay back there. Love. I want to make this perf. I want to change them. And then it will be easier for me to love it. And I'm, I'm telling the brain, no, 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 you're not good at being loving. There's a whole other range of us that most of us think of as our heart that is ready to go with love, no matter how broken somebody is, no matter how irritable they are, no matter how they're breathing. <laughs> I love that example because a lot of people can write, oh, they're breathing. It's, it's <laughs> amazing how irritable some brains can be, in, especially yes. in certain people and especially in certain situ- situations. But this matters so much because that we're talking about a child and or we're talking about your parent. That's why this matters. If you can go right there, that's probably the most meaningful relationships we can have. And if you can get out of your own way and let that love through, it you it you will feel like, oh my God, I can't believe I did I didn't do this sooner. It doesn't change them and the brain's gonna be possibly mad about that, but it's just so much easier. It's so much easier because yeah. all of us have this. Because in my view, all of us are source energy. So all of us are capable of love and all of us can give ourselves permission for no reason at all to just let that love out of us and flow through it and watch. Without there being a condition. Right. Zero conditions, zero perfection, zero fixing, zero them getting that right or them getting that right. And watch your brain because your brain will go, no, 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 no. They haven't earned it yet, or they haven't fixed that. They haven't learned their lesson. You know, all of those silly things. It just So just be aware as your love is flowing out of you. And you may have tears. There may be a lot of melting of icy structures, sort of feeling of, oh, my God. like wait. And then, and then the guilt and the shame, possibly. And just be ready to give the love to yourself, too. But watch what your brain is mad about, in a way, as you're letting the love out. Because that's the stuff you just want to watch out for. Just put it to the side and let the love out of you. It's so much easier. You benefit. They definitely benefit. They might be confused. And that's totally okay. That's good. I like confusion. When the brain is confused, that's like, we're in. We got, we have our in. I think one of the things that I, I have learned about my brain is that, and why it's so stealth, because programs exist. And if we were unloving to everybody in our field and that program, that irritable program was running on everybody, we would know that it was on us as the common denominator to fix it. The brain doesn't work that way. The brain keeps its programs running and operative by choosing one host. And in that way, people think, it's not me. It's them. And that is incorrect. If you have this irritable program running anywhere, it is a ubiquitous program. It is yours to work with. Don't get duped by nobody else bothers me but that person. That's that's a mistake. That's a misunderstanding of how the brain operates. 
And by putting it onto one person, it says that person has to change. I don't. And it abdicates the responsibility. And that's why we end up in these situations where we vilify. So all our different programs notice now what are the what are the pockets that your brain uses to keep that program alive? All right. Those are really, really good things. And then the other thing that I will say in terms of the programming and the belief system, one you want to look at, given that this is a parenting, child parent um, discussion, look at your beliefs about parenting. Look at the beliefs you still hold. So many people are still, as adults, pissed off about what they're not getting from their parents because of the ideal they didn't fit their mold of an ideal parent. And then we then do it to our kids. It's like, I now want to be that ideal parent, but I don't have the ideal kid. So now I have to foist that belief system on the next generation, right? To fix my kid to be the ideal kid that serves my version of an ideal parent. If you just get rid of those belief systems, I don't know what an ideal parent is, and I certainly don't know how to be an ideal parent, and I definitely don't know what an ideal kid is. You've like plucked out so many weeds that are creating stressful intergenerational relationships. Don't change the relationships. Change the brain. Change the programming. Throw it out. And the best way to throw something out that I've seen is give your brain a better idea to run right? The bigger the idea, that's the beliefs are the biggest ideas. That's really what they are. So some people may just be like, well, yeah, that sounds great, Dr. Langler. <laughs> but but how do you just throw out a belief? By offering yourself a better one. It's simple. It is so simple. But again, the brain doesn't understand that. So don't ask it to. Just like, well, what if that's not true? What if that's not true That that all of my hopes and dreams for what my kid can be has nothing to do with them and has everything to do with me. They are not beholden to my vision or my goals or my hope, my dreams for what they can be or what I wish I could have been. That's a that's a belief system I'm holding. And the start of the the break in that which we've talked about in the beliefs the beliefs episode is what if that's not true? Yeah. Just like it probably wasn't true for you with your parents. Right. And beliefs, it has to be reiterated over and over and over again. Beliefs are malleable. They are changeable, which by definition means they are not truths. Because what is true is always true. So if you want to bust through a belief, you want to ask yourself, is this true? Is it always true? And that's how you start to, and how do I behave when I believe that truth? Because your beliefs create your actions. And if you don't like the way you're behaving, I don't like it when I'm irritable. That really upsets me. I don't like that me. But I know that it's based on a belief. And look, I'm going to, you know, full disclosure here. This takes a while. This is not an easy one. All right. This is not a, oh, I heard this podcast and I'm good to go. This takes practice. It takes awareness. It takes fortitude. This is not easy. Um, habits that you're changing. Yeah. Yeah. So stick with it, even though it's like, no, this person really pisses me off. It really is them. That's a non-starter. It's a non-starter to believe that. So just keep pushing that that away and just be like, my irritation is my emotion. That is the way you feel is your responsibility 1000%. And we have choices. Our brain will tell us that, well, I can't help it. I'm just irritated. Oh, but you can help it. You can help yourself by, you don't have to be irritated. Somebody doing something doesn't have to have that effect on you at all. And it's like, whoa, what, how do I do that? By recognizing the patterns and by going, what if, okay, I do recognize that. I notice that that's irritating me. What if I play with the idea that that doesn't irritate me? 
What if I play with the idea that I'm pretending I have control and that my irritation is somehow productive and that the more irritated I, I will be, that somehow it's going to make them stop doing that? Has that been working so far? That's not logical. So that's one part related to a volley back to the cool things and perfect things that you said. The other thing about the truths and the beliefs that I want to offer here is that the words that my brain really, really liked that, that came to me a few years ago is we're talking about the, the truths that are true, whether you believe them or not. Those are emphatic truths and those fit more in the realm of, oh, okay. Cause there's a lot of things that as humans, we're really, really good. We're pretending they're true. Yeah. And our brain can't tell the difference. So our brains in this is in this instance of ir irritating um, an irritating child or an irritating parent, and you know their love, there's love there, but you don't feel it as easily as you want to, and maybe you don't feel it as much as you do with another, with the other parent or with the other child if there's another child. So there's just there's a lot to be curious about here, so that you can let again more of that love in to yourself. Yeah. And it is, we talked about this in another podcast too, there is a space, even opening up the possibility that you can behave another way, or there is a version of you or a perspective that doesn't view this as irritating, that doesn't view it this way. You're just making space for that possibility. And once you start to do that, things really... I don't know. It's sort of like when you have a knot in your necklace and you you kind of just massage that knot a little bit and you start to see, you can't get it out, but you start to see that there is a way that this is going to unknot. And, and that's really what happens. So the brain is really, you know, nice. <laughs> it's, it's very streamlined and making us, you know, it's stream, it streamlined. So we can go down a, a negative skew or a rabbit hole with it. But just massaging that, you know, th that brain just a little bit yeah. also sends it in a reparative direction quite easily. So it and we don't have to muscle it just opening up possibility. Your brain almost starts to open without you really having to do that much. So do take baby steps here. And the other thing the brain will say is, nope, I don't see any change. These changes are subtle. They are incremental. They're not what you expect. And, and so the brain is looking for a very specific, like, you know, response or solution. That's not it. I do so, want to play with that though, Jill. Go ahead. I, I love it because I mean, my, I, I, as you guys have probably noticed that Jill, you are masterful at the brain. I have experience with the brain, but you're, I feel like you're masterful at unlocking kind of how the brain is working. I feel like my superpower is more the transcendent side of let's have a big change. Let's have some ma major breakthrough that is totally transcendent and beyond ourselves. So I do want to offer for, for anyone listening to this and feeling like they do want to experiment with this, but their brain is saying, I really don't know how I hear what you guys are saying, but I don't know how I would even do that. How do I all of a sudden allow love that I've never felt as deeply as I want to for a certain person? How do you do that? I'm going to give you a tip here. Okay, so this is the transcendent method. Um, do you believe that there is, do you believe in God or do you believe in some higher, deeper, better source of love than, than you're feeling you're accessing to? If your answer is yes, that's helpful. Or that you can just wonder, is there a part of me that's better at loving this person than I've been so far? And that you close your eyes and you just imagine whatever that better love force and source is than you, than you feel like you've been. Almost imagine it like, um, like a ball of beautiful, loving, warm energy coming up from the inside of you, like you're the earth's crust and a hill is forming right around your heart. And you're just saying, okay, show me, show me what it would feel like to love that person as much as I, I know I want to. And it can be literally just like a, 
boom, like a love bomb and you get warm and tingly and you may get emotional and you may just, it's almost like you're asking God in a very literal way, show me how much you love this person. Cause I want to be that for them. Mm-hmm. And it can be huge. It can be incredibly transformative and you doing it once proves to you, you can do it anytime you want. It's not cheating. I love it. It's a win-win. I really like that. I think, interestingly, when I say that the the um, the changes are incremental, it's not. It's almost like to me when I have an aha moment, it's in the most mundane of things. So it is transcendent but it's not where I expected it to be. It literally is so much, it's miraculous in its simplicity. And you feel it in your whole being, but it doesn't, it never looks like what I expected it to look like, right? So my brain is looking for big lightning bolts and you know, whatever. And it ends up just being this wash of, oh my God, there's so much peace that I get. There's so much, it's almost like there's no doubt. There's no, it, it's, I always say the change in this one little area is global. The shift is not just with this person. My whole, I've reached another level in the video game and I know there's no going back, right? So I'm just saying, don't set up markers for your brain of what this is supposed to look like. Stay open and curious and allowing and in that subtlety, it is profound. It is absolutely profound. And it happens to me when I'm walking down the street. It happens like it's not, you can't make this shit happen. It just, it's miraculous and simple and the norm. But we're looking, I always say, if you lose your earring in the bedroom, don't look in the kitchen. Right. And that's what the brain does. It has you looking in the wrong places for your transcendence. Beautiful. I know we wanted to, we were hoping to make this a mini one and I think we covered it. I I agree. Everybody's, everybody's capable of this. No one is incapable of loving their child. No one is incapable of loving their parent. Um, But the brain will tell you otherwise and making that easier. But I, I hope that Anyone that if you feel this way, if you know someone that feels this way, I hope you can share this episode literally with them. Um, I'm thinking of so many people that I've been contractors that have been through my house that are painters and mentioned that their, you know, eight-year-old daughter drives him crazy because she talks all the time. And there's a part of me energetically that's like, oh, I want to do a reading so much. <laughs> you know what I mean? And just say, like, yes. let me help you love your daughter. You know what I mean? Um, because yeah. some of us are very sensitive slash aware of somebody else's irritation. And for some of us, it's heartbreaking when it's their child or when it's their parent. It's just like, oh, there's a whole other way to look at this. We're capable of so much more than we realize. And this could change someone's life, maybe two people's lives, maybe more. Yeah. And, you know, nobody needs to change so that you can feel better. Mm-hmm. Nobody needs to change. I. I can't say that enough. So true. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jill.